Um, and it is a great pleasure for me to introduce uh, colleague Yuli Barishnikov from University of Illinois Urbana Champaign. Uh, wait, that, and you have the presentation, so you can bring up your presentation, Yuli, when you're ready. Um, okay. You'll be talking to us about uh, time out of joint, uh, reparameterization, invariant tools for time series. Yuli, whenever you're ready. Oh, okay. Do you see the share button at the bottom? I do. Uh, okay. We can see it. Perfect. Okay. So, uh, just in case, I will pause on Slack the uh, link to um, A link to my uh, to my presentation. Okay, so uh, yeah, this is work which was evolving for for a little while, um, and it's um, it's rather practical, rather applied work. But it started as um, some theoretical consideration. So the the question I uh, I was thinking was the following. So like, imagine you have some time series. You observe some you know, some process evolving in time, so trajectory in dimensional space, something, something. And, um, but what happens if you don't know, you're uncertain about your time? And, you know, there, there are many situations I sort of came to that, you know, during some like very fascinating practical talk about a guy who was uh, planting his sensor network on the side, on, you know, on the slope of a volcano, Obviously, he didn't want a lot of people to go there and check. And, you know, one of the biggest problems in those sensor networks was that, you know, all these computers were supposed to always time synchronize, time stamp it precisely because they were measuring these tremors and they wanted to do it very precisely. And it turns out it was the biggest problem because they were always failing and, you know, like panicking, kernel was shutting down and so on. So, so like, Time reparameterization turned out to be like the right way to do, you know, like ignore the timestamps synchronization, just record whatever you have and then try to synchronize it. But in general, what happens if you have some time series, but you know, how the time evolves is um, is uncertain. So, so you can think about it as sort of, there is an actual internal clock and um, you know, internal clock of the process, which is tau, but there is this physical time and those, you know, like your internal clock is not aligned with the physical clock. So what we can say, how we can study such things. And, and there is another very, you know, like when I started to sort of think about systematically, I realized that actually we have, uh, you know, hugely uh, you know, huge practical field of um, uh, of the uh, phenomenon of this kind, where you have, um, you know, your time parameterization is not exactly, you know, coincides, you know, your, your internal clock is not exactly coincides with your physical clock, is the phenomena which is which are cyclic, yet not periodic. Typically, you know, in the common language, we use the cyclic and periodic phenomena are more or less interchangeably, right? But it's not true. A lot of phenomena are cyclic, but not periodic, right? So you have something like, so here we have two functions on the right, they are visibly periodic function. On the left, it's visibly not periodic, but you know, it's exactly the same function. It's just, you know, I screwed up a little bit with the, you know, timeline, you know, but if you, if you look at it and you see, yeah, that's exactly the same function. You can map one to another. Just you know, you have this uh, sequence of, you know, global maximum, local minimum, global local minimum, global minimum. Sorry, and so you have this sequence of uh, patterns. You can easily map one to another. But you know, if you look at something on the left, you would definitely imagine that this guy is whatever, and this guy is nice and periodic. So, and um, so again. Cyclic processes are there, and you know, uh, not of the, not all of them are periodic. And in nature, they're actually more cyclic processes than periodic processes, right? So you have this uh, your gate; it's obviously cyclic, but 
you know, depending on where you go up slope, down slope, and, uh, you know, whether you stumble a little bit or you're, you're pensive, you slow down, you you know, but, you know, it's the same sequence, more or less same sequence of muscles and uh, bones uh, moving one way or other. Population dynamics, again, you know, like, it is more or less driven by the tropic chains and so on. And, uh, but also driven by whatever, you know, you have the, you know, very nice spring, you know, some species thrives, then it goes down this uh, tropic chain and, uh, you know, you have some nice cycle, but then, you know, like for a long time, you don't have much happening. So like everything slows down and so on. Business cycles, notoriously, so it's like, Obviously, I have to show some picture of, um, you know, U.S. economy over some period. And yeah, you can see sort of some cycles, but definitely, you know, if, if you had nice periodic structure to business cycles, life would be so much less exciting. Uh, so anyway, so that's... Uh, so this is the uh, sort of this high level motivation of what what I wanted to do. And, but, you know, once you start to think about it, you know, like you have this, uh, you know, you have this internal clock, maybe, you know, like periodic and nice, but, you know, you're, when you map it to physical time, you know, you're losing your periodicity. You, you, you don't, again, this is example of what happens in your cardiac cycle. So once you lose this periodicity, then, you know, one of the problems is that, uh, you're completely losing 99% of your tools for analysis of your time series because, you know, harmonic analysis is such, uh, you know, such a pervasive and it's beautiful, extremely powerful tool, but it's completely relies on the, uh, you know, on the fact that timeline is a homogeneous space. You can shift it. There is a group acting on your timeline. There is, uh, you know, just it's, boring group, it's just a group of shifts, but it is there, and, you know, that's exactly what we use, you know, like all our extensions, all, all our bases and harmonic analysis are just using the fact that time is homogeneous space, we expand everything in terms of those characters, and, um, you know, what happens if you don't have that? So imagine no Fourier, no cosine, no autocorrelation functions, no nothing. Okay, so how to build the toolbox for this uh, pretty alarming situation when you don't have any, uh, you know, don't have any um, homogeneity of your time space. Okay, here's a little bit of an answer. It's uh, the answer is called iterated integrals. So again, you have this trajectory, the dimensional space. I mean, you can generalize the story to, to sort of arbitrary manifolds, but, you know, let's see, it. let's stay in our convenient Euclidean framework. So we have the d-dimensional space, we have this time series coordinates, and we are looking for the functionals, the functions of trajectories, which will survive reparameterizations, right? So taking average, for example, is forbidden, right? Because you know, you don't know how much time you're spending in each particular type of uh, place of trajectory. So you have to be very careful what you can do and what you cannot. So what can be the descriptors to those trajectories? Um, okay. It turns out that the question is classical and has an answer. I mean, it's... 19th century answer, but, you know, the people remembered about it, um, sort of, uh, you know, do you, you know, thanks to Katie Chen, who at the time he sort of like remembered it and reintroduced it in broad mathematical practice, was here at Illinois, University of Illinois in Urbana Champaign. He was using it for some, you know, topology and was like very, very important, uh, you know, very important development that gave rise to some nice branch of uh, of topology, you know, the, uh, anyway, so, uh, but we don't, don't use this topology whatsoever, and so iterated integrals are functions of trajectories, so you have a trajectory, and to get 
some collection of numbers to each trajectory associated collection of numbers and they are uh, this collection of numbers they, they are filtered so they're sort of the built-in hierarchy there are sort of invariants those integrals of order zero one two three and so on so uh, the zeros one are the just the constants right and the next like the definition is the definition is the following you you know if you already know the integral uh, so you if you already defined the the saturated integral of order less than k then you can take this integral so you take the you know from zero to s you take the sub part of your trajectory from zero to s it will give you some function of this s of this parameter s and then you integrate it against uh, against any of the coordinates and then you get something new for example if you just if a l is just a constant then you get an increment weighted increments of your of your trajectory again the first the integral of order one is just the the, uh, the increments and uh, you know but you know as, as k grows as the order of iterated integral grows they become more and more interesting and you know there's another sort of formula and again you recognize probably this precar approximation formula here so you can just uh, this is another sort of way to represent the iterated integral support k they are spent by those by those functions uh anyway so you have those families of functionals of trajectories and what we know about them well the good news is that they are reparameterization invariant means you change the parameters, you change the clock along the trajectory, the integral will remain the same. For example, the increment, how much you're gained altogether, will remain the same no matter how you parameterize your trajectory. There's some little bit of, uh, you know, a hiccup there, you know, the, the, if you have, imagine you have trajectory and then in the middle of the way you stop, go somewhere, they return exactly the same way back. You do a detour. So if you do this detour, insert into your trajectory detour, then you know your iterated integrals won't change. It's a little bit annoying, but you know detours are not happening. With probability one, you will be returning by some other trajectory, so you will be deviating and will be detected by by those integrals. So anyway, and the theorem by Chen, which says essentially that after detours and reprimitization, that's complete. You know characterization of your trajectory so meaning if you are two trajectories without the tours and have the same iterated integrals of all orders then they're exactly the same trajectory maybe up to shift so if they start in the same point and have the same integrals of all orders then they're the same so that's the perfect answer for us it means that you know we can work with them so anyway, there's a lot to this story. This actually beautiful mathematical construct and related to like very nice combinatorics of whole bases and whatnot. Again, it's completely material for the purpose of this talk. And uh, but you know what is material is that you know they have they form a complete uh, complete um, set of functions on representation variant functionals of, of trajectories and Euclidean space. Uh, so that's immediately opens the big window for exploratory data analysis. If you want to, to say something about your trajectory, just you know compute a lot of those uh, iterated path integrals, iterated integrals, and um, just try to do something about them. And this is, by the way, a route which, as I discovered, uh, was taken by a group. So Terry Lyons in um, in Oxford, he is. Uh, he was doing some, you know, so these iterated path integrals for Brownian trajectories were known as Wiener cows, again, going back to the 30s. Um, and, you know, Lyons was studying those um, iterated integrals on, you know, trajectories which have even, you know, even rougher than the, the holder exponent is less than one half, which is the Brownian exponent. So anyway, there is some nice analytic story uh, nice story from analysis and a little bit of probability theory uh which you know was investigated and th then he decided that it's you know like just because those integrals iterated integrals you know 
to have this reprogrammation invariant property. So he was popular, you know, he started, you know, some group uh, data analysis, which is exactly do doing exactly the same. So generate a lot of those uh, iterated integrals, call them path signatures, and try to do some data analysis. Uh, you know, it's not the route, again, I would like to take, because one of the problems is that, as you can imagine, it's uh, those signatures are extremely uh, prone to noise, extremely susceptible to noise, so you have like, some explosion of uh, explosion of problems if you consider iterated intervals of higher, higher order. Okay, uh, no questions so far? Good. Okay, so what I will concentrate from now on is the iterated integrals of order two. Again, the first order is just the total increments. The second order are the oriented areas. So second order invariants, they all look more or less the same, so rather generated by, by those expressions. So you take one coordinate, integrate against the other, and subtract the other integrated against the one. So, and of course, if you look at this integral, then you immediately recognize what it is. It's an oriented algebraic area. So you take the trajectory in d-dimensional space, project it into any plane, for example, in this case, in the coordinate planes, uh, you know, just took two take two coordinates, xk and xl, look what your trajectory looks there, and compute the oriented area of this, uh, encompassed by this trajectory. So if you circle around some point twice, you count this point twice. If you circle around it, you know, in the negative direction, meaning clockwise, you subtract this, you know, point. So anyway, so you have these related areas. And uh, so Rob Greist, uh, you know, we discussed these ideas with him here. You know, he produced wonderful, uh, uh, YouTube videos for his course of multivariate calculus. So as you can look uh, to go uh, along this link for a much better presentation than mine. So anyway, so so what in practical terms? How we want to use them uh, practically? So turn, here's the key heuristics I am using here. It is the following. You um, so imagine you have two functions, blue and red. And even imagine that, you know, if you go from left to right along your time axis, you imagine that, okay, your red goes up and then blue follows. Red goes down, a little we're shooting and then returns to zero and blue follows. So you'd call that red is the leader and blue is the follower. It turns out that this relation is pretty succinctly captured by oriented area. So if you plot parametrically this red versus, like blue versus red, then you see that uh, this closed curve, this closed curve we encounter, it surrounds certain area. It surrounds it in a positive way, counterclockwise. So if I flip them, if I say, okay, so what if my, you know, if I call the first, the blue one, the first, and the red one, then of course the whole thing will flip. I will surround the same area, but counterclock, sorry, clockwise, and therefore it will be negative area. So if I sort of change the order, my oriented area will notice it. So I will have this a little bit of intuition. And if you have this couple of curves, couple of trajectories, and one of them is roughly following the other, then the oriented area surrounded by the parametric curve will be positive if the first curve is leader and the second is follower, and negative otherwise. Okay? This is, again, this is heuristics. It's an intuitive idea. But let's start building on it. Again, so this is our primitive from which we start. Uh, and we're doing this, you know, like again, this leadership, leader follower or leader lead lag relation is uh, built out of these iterated integrals. Therefore, manifestly, there are 
uh, reparabilization in the back end. So anyway, so what shall we do? What if we have d-dimensional trajectory, trajectory in d space, then um, what we can have is um, we can build, you know, find those oriented area for any pair of those traces, right? So we can build what is called uh, a lead matrix, matrix whose entries will, will be those oriented areas. So for each pair of coordinates, we'll project the trajectory in this plane and we'll find the area. It will be some number, we'll get matrix. It will be skew-symmetric matrix because of this phenomenon. You'll sort of flip the coordinates, the sign of your uh, algebraic area flips. And we look at this matrix and ask ourselves, okay, what we can derive from it. So let's try to, you know, try to call into existence some model for a phenomenon. So imagine you have a situation when your, you know, coordinates are essentially, you know, some, you know, some function and essentially you're just following one after the other uh, like this heartbeat situation. So you're observing the same function, but with some lag, with some phase shifts. So you have this uh, periodic function and they're going this way. And they're trying to recover this cyclic order. So imagine I have several traces, several you know, time series, about which I have suspicion, I suspect, you know, conjecture that some of them are leaders and some of them are followers. Again, the meaning of it can be very different. It may be just, you know, some nice weather followed by the proliferation of some species, followed by proliferation by, by another species. Or it might be some propagation of some signal along neuron or propagation of spikes along some area in the brain. What not? So, but in general, the picture is, okay, you measure, you pick some, you sense some signals and to try to discover which of them are leaders and each of them followers. If you have the cyclic phenomenon, then probably you can discover it. So again, the chain of offset model is that essentially we are looking at the same functions. May, the same function may be scaled differently and with offsets, but uh, we'll produce, we want to recognize those, uh, those delays. And of course you can cry fall at this time and say, okay, you know what? Now you're back to this offsets. This offsets means you do have this uh, invariance, shift invariance. You do have this uh, action of this, uh, you, you know, suddenly you, you consider a circle, which is homogeneous space again, and say, yes, yeah, sure. However, this is our internal clock about which we'll, you know, can assume whatever we want. It's just the physical observations are not aligned with our internal clock. And the fact that our tools are reparameterization invariant means, you know, you don't assume much. So anyway, so let's uh, let's work with this uh, in this series of assumptions. So again, we have this collection of functions, which essentially the same function, maybe scaled a little bit differently, and offset. You know, these functions are just following each other with some collection of offsets, and we want to reconstruct those. And of course, we observe not the trajectory itself, but some noisy version of it. So we form this matrix and you know so if your function again if you're living on the circle we can take the Fourier transform and you know so this this is the standard uh, you know thing we'll be getting so we'll be essentially we'll be getting so you lead matrix sorry about this so you lead matrix essentially will be just a collection of shifted version of certain odd function so this is an odd function of t and you consider this function at the differences of the offset so this automatically will get the skew symmetric matrix and the question now is okay so you have the skew symmetric matrix can you recover the offsets alpha so so if you have some coefficient which dominates everything so essentially you can if you can assume that you more or less have just a single harmonics then your lead matrix automatically has rank two. I mean, being skew symmetric matrix, it's, uh, you know, it's a very even one. So it means the rank is always an even number and your eigenvalues are complex conjugate, like 
just uh, purely imaginary complex conjugated uh, numbers. So, and uh, the uh, so it will be sum of you know of two uh, rank one matrices having this particular structure. So, and the question is, can we recover this matrix? Well, we can. So, like if we can, if we have this matrix, if our lead matrix has this rank two structure, then we can probably hope to recover those shifts alphas, those phases, and therefore the cyclic order of the terms. So, so in general, there is a little bit of linear algebra, so how you can, so the, the, the you know, the upshot is that, imagine you have this rank two, rank two skew-symmetric matrix, then um, essentially the, uh, which was generated by this chain of offsets model, then essentially the eigen vectors, the components of eigenvectors, will be some linear transformation of just uh, those shifts. So you take the unit circle, the shifts will be sitting on the unit circle in this, you know, in exactly this uh, cyclic order with exactly those phases which you're, you know, started with. And then you do a little bit of linear transformation. So it will be not necessarily a circle, it will be some ell ellipse, but the cyclic order of the components of your eigenvector so eigenvector will necessarily have complex components. You plot them in a complex plane and cyclic order of the arguments of those components, you'll be reflecting exactly the cyclic order of your shifts in your chain of offsets model. Okay? This is a very simple consideration that allows you to reconstruct the cyclic order of the components. And of course, by continuity, you can argue that, you know, like if you're you know, if your matrix is, uh, you know, if you have several, again, several your Fourier transform has a lot of components, but, you know, one of them is eliminated, and then, you know, model with some noise, you know, you will still be, will be able to recover the cyclic order because nothing changes too much. Anyway, so, so it leads to practical, you know, some practical, you know, pipe, of the uh, tool, so essentially what happens, you have this lead matrix, you do spectral composition, you take this, uh, you know, leading eigenvalues, and if the leading eigenvalues are much bigger than the, you know, third leading eigenvalues, again, they, they come in absolute, like the, uh, the common pairs, complex conjugate pairs, uh, purely imaginary pairs, these uh, eigenvalues, then, you know, so if the, the ratios are such indicative of the, signal dominating everything, then you can try to reconstruct your, your model. Anyway, so that's that much for theory. The rest of the talk, the last 15 minutes, I will spend on a couple of, um, several examples. So, so the computational pipe, once again, is uh, look at the data, normalize them as, as, you know, form this sample lead matrix. And again, you can argue that there is some statistical guarantees that lead matrix will represent what you want to see, do the spectral analysis and reconstruct the cyclic order from the uh, order of the arguments of the components of your leading eigenvector. Okay, so this is completely idealistic situation. You have 12 harmonic functions shifted by some particular, in some particular way as expected. So this is, the, the plot below shows the, the traces themselves the spectrum of the resulting lead matrix. And then we'll take the lead matrix and rearrange it according to, so this is sort of the, okay, this is the spectrum. This is the components of the corresponding eigenvalue. So this, I call this constellations. So those uh, crosses here, those crosses here are, those crosses here are components uh, of the, uh, leading eigenvector, and then I rearrange the components of my vector in the cyclic order, and then this lead matrix exhibits this nice band structure. So, four leads seven, seven leads one, and so on. So, this band structure is the hallmark, is the, the ideal situation, which indeed indicates that your uh, chain of offset model was correct. So, if you see the lead matrix, this banded matrix so if we change the after reshuffling of the uh, reshuffling of the components, 
we see the uh, <coughs> lead matrix having this band structure means yeah we do have this cyclic phenomenon okay so this is the same but the noisy version so the traces you can see that really really hard to parse what's going on the constellation this is not nice and round anymore but still you can see the lead matrix has this banded structure a little bit distorted but still pretty recognizable okay so those are simulated data so let's go now to something real so look at the business cycle so the business cycle so what kind of cyclic phenomena i want to look at so again we have as everybody knows the US economy and it takes this more or less you know caused by each time we know what it caused by but each time it comes as a surprise uh, so we have this uh, the, the you know the cycles of expansion the cycles of contractions and it is known to uh, investment professionals so everybody has some uh, 401k or probably heard about those uh, and you know people go to these people to, to financial uh, consultants and they tell you that okay so know what uh, we have this uh, you know in the beginning of the business cycle you have to invest in some particular class of stocks something is growing fast everybody in the beginning of the business cycle everybody wants to invest so financial the banks are doing well the energy firms are doing well but not so you have this uh, uh, knowledge in the end of the business cycle, people say, okay, because everything is going down, however, people still will need food and other consumables. So this, you know, like non-periodic, non-cyclical consumables uh, will be, you know, not that they'll be performing great, but they will be performing great compared to others. So there's this uh, investment knowledge about when to invest in each particular business cycle. So this is the, it's, you know, I did this uh, computation a few years ago. So now they have, like more sectors but back then it was the 10 sectors and this is the typical uh, copy of some investment prospectus which says that you know early in the business cycle invest in financials what not or not in energy by the way i was wrong and late in the business cycle invest in that in the recession you invest in this okay so utilities invest in utilities people still need the heat and uh, heat and light Anyway, so this is the in sort of the financial industry knowledge, the folklore. What I did, I just took these sectors, and you know we have this uh, nice data for the the sectors. So this display shows what the sectors look like, and I did the this whole computational pipe for the uh, um, cyclicity analysis. So it was between two thousand. It was about 10 years, I remember, 2005 to maybe 2016. Uh, so you see in the middle this uh, great recession. So anyway, so we do this uh, again. So we do this uh, uh, lead matrix, this is spectrum lead matrix. You see that the leading guys are relatively high compared to the, all the rest. So we do the cyclic ordering of the components. We do have this Benzit matrix. This is constellation and so yeah so we do observe some kind of cycle uh, and, uh, and this is the uh, comparison of the results so this fidelity is the industry knowledge and and you see that by and large so we have this group of the you know financials industries and cyclical then you know like essentially the permutation is pretty close. The cyclic permutation I discovered is pretty close to what the industry tells you to expect. The only big difference is technology and utilities. They got some somewhat crossed. I don't know why. So, so something wrong about utilities in this picture. Or maybe my picture is correct and the industry assumptions are so anyway, this is the what we can say about the uh, what we can say about this industrial economic application. But this is another application. It's dealing with the uh, oh no, it's a little bit uh, okay. 
this is another, another I mean, I, I apply this uh, tool of recovering the cyclic order in several situations and, you know, like we did it in various uh, brain analysis, but over the past summer, we worked with a group of uh, neurophysiologists um, on uh, just, essentially we just looked at the large collection of functional MRI traces and we are just looking for those presence of those cycles. And um, so the traces, it's uh, again, this, this human connectome project, as you probably know, the functional MRI, uh, they measure the uh, activities of the brain, you know, functional activities, like in which part of the brain, how much oxygen goes. So the more oxygen, the more activity in this part of the brain, this is the, the assumption. There's like a large collection of freely available traces uh, in this human connectome project. And the people were studying, trying to understand this sort of network structure of the brain in this, uh, you know, for a long time. And this is one of the, uh, so we just took the, the measurements which done by, by the others. And the people were looking for the context for, you know, the people were looking for the, um, uh, to understand, you know, for this functional MRI traces to try to understand the sort of the cycles in the brain for quite a long time. This, um, so this is the, so this is the, uh, okay, maybe I'll just have to make it smaller, unfortunately. It's something with formatting. Okay, so this is the, uh, the work by, uh, like cycle of work by Mitra and Reichel. And they were looking at the, essentially they were taking the brain, aggregating everything as like large region in the brain, like few large regions and looking at these uh, traces. But then they were falling into this, uh, you know, default mode of every signal analyst. They were trying to, to, to do autocorrelation function. They were trying to shift those traces and see, okay, how much of the correlations they can uh, get between different shifted traces for different regions. So they were looking at this sort of time invariant uh, situation and they discovered some cycles there. They were looked at the, uh, um, they discovered some, you know, um, you know, some waves, you know, global brain waves uh, going there. Uh, so again, their tools were relying on this autocorrelation it forced them to look at very large region in the brain. So they split the brain into like maybe six or seven regions. And uh, the brain, the waves they were discovering are comparable to the subhertz because essentially all of MRI frequencies are hertz, like it's about hertz, one, you know, one measurement is a second or maybe like point, point 0.7 seconds each measurement. So you cannot discover anything going really fast in the brain, but the slow, the slow uh, uh, activities you can investigate. So this is the context. So there is a big activity in trying to understand this uh, global brain waves. And uh, so what we did, we're, okay, now I can make it bigger. So what we did, we're just, we didn't fall into this, um, trap of trying to um, trying to look at the uh, like big regions we, we looked at the uh, neurophysiologically defined regions of interest they, they have this small maybe uh, like couple centi couple cubic centimeters large regions which they believe are responsible for some particular you know some particular functions or cluster of functions <clears throat> and we looked at the corresponding uh, you know, it was about 70 regions of interest. We look at the corresponding, uh, we constructed the lead matrix for the 70 regions of interest, and we looked at the, um, you know, did a little bit of analysis, which of them like represent, which subset of those regions represent some candidates for this chain of offset models. So we selected 14 of those regions, and we recreated this lead matrix and reshuffled it. So this is reshuffled, reorganized lead matrix, where you have this like four leading regions, prefrontal, postfrontal, left and right. And definitely we have some following the lagging regions here, like lateral occipital regions are the following. 
So if you concentrate on this block of the matrix, where we definitely have some leaders and the followers. So, and here the, uh, and here the sort of our, the things which are interesting. So this is, this trajectory uh, shows how much they oriented it. So we took just two of those uh, regional. So post-central is well-pronounced leader, lateral occipital, again, rough, right and left. Uh, lateral occipital is well-pronounced follower. And you looked at the, uh, how the oriented areas, so we plot them spirometrically and you look how the oriented area grows in time. So you have this uh, <clears throat> 13,000, sorry, 1300 frames, maybe like 10,000 seconds, something like that. And, uh, and we look how much the oriented area grows. And this is a plot which is ama uh, keeps amazing me because um, because if you do anything random, if you add any like two-dimensional Brownian motion, then yeah, you will have ballistic behavior like in this picture. However, the ballistic behavior will be, will be completely different. So here, the structure of this plot is completely clear. So you have this burst of activity. So something happens. You have these jumps, and nothing happens between the jumps. So you have jumps of different sides coming in pretty unpredictable intervals. There is nothing, no clear periods here. And, you know, and essentially flat or maybe whatever, some little fluctuations between those jumps. And those jumps, if you look at them, so this is jumps happening slightly before 200, which is this one, right? So, so this is pair of, uh, this pair of plots, and you obviously see that one of them is leader, one of them is follower. This is where you're gaining your oriented area, right? There are some other pairs which are, uh, which are much less pronounced. So this is slightly before 400, where we have this. Something like, maybe something like uh, this. Yeah, this is slightly before 400. You see, there is no clear behavior between leader and follower. So, this picture, which again, it's a very robust structure. So we looked at, uh, you know, hundreds randomly selected hundreds uh, of uh, of pictures of this kind, and they all exhibit this uh, like amazing bursts of leader following pairs. So it's. This picture is completely unmistakable. There is some wave coming through the brain, coming relatively slowly. It happens on this, you know, around three to seven seconds. And this, you know, these waves are, you know, happening at like pretty space within themselves. You know, I like this uh, story because I have no idea what these waves mean. I have no background on, you know, neurophysiology. If whatever happens in the brain is complete mystery to me. However, there is absolutely unmistakable, you know, reading of this plot. There are waves and they're coming. Okay, with this, I'll come to conclusions again. So we have this cerebralization invariant tools are extremely important, especially between when you want to work with, uh, you know, you want to make distinction between periodic and cyclic phenomena and to want, you know, to be principled and not to deploy harmonic analysis in its uh, in any of its uh, avatars. The separated integrals of path integrals. It's a nice family. It's a complete family of invariants you can use, and it's uh, within the chain of offset model. The this pipe, computational pipe of uh, lead matrix and resulting spectral recovery of the cyclic order of the uh, components of your observed time series seem to be very viable and applicable in various situations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Julie. Um